sermon, Forgiveness, Mercy, and Compassion, or Compassion, Mercy, and Forgiveness. It doesn't really matter in what order I use these words, because I am going to show you that they're all connected. There's a close relationship between these three characteristics, and you can't have the one without the others. We will see how religious persons, righteous persons, I should say, manifest these characteristics in their lives. We will see that we as God's people have to be truly merciful, we have to be moved with compassion, and we have to be ready to forgive. And we will also see that in this world, none of that exists. And how unrighteous persons show that they don't have any of it. And so I'd like to start with showing you how God looks at this world and how he looks at this country in particular. And we find this testimony by God in Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord has a charge against the inhabitants of the land, a charge, a complaint. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land, but there is swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery. They break all restraint with bloodshed after bloodshed. And therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air, and even the fish of the sea will be taken away. No mercy in the land. And that means no compassion. And that means no willingness to forgive. And so God is telling us in his church, as his people, to behave and to act quite differently. We can't be falling into this description, as we have just read it. So let's first look at the book of Zechariah, chapter 7, and let's see what God requires of us. Zechariah, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion. Everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. Talking about the church of God. Talking about the fact that we in God's church have to show mercy and compassion one to another. The Apostle Peter echoes the same command in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And as we go through the scriptures, you will see the close connection between mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brethren, be tender-hearted, be courteous. And here is an explanation, a description of what it means to be compassionate, to be of a forgiving mind, to have mercy, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Quite a contrast to the description of the world as we have just read it in the book of Hosea. Showing compassion means not to return evil for evil. 
Notice Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and let's look at verses 12 to 13. Again, Paul is talking to the church. He's talking to the brethren. He's talking to you and to me. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. You see the connection here between tender mercies and forgiveness. Let's go back to the book of Hosea. And let's notice chapter 12 and verse 6. Hosea chapter 12 and verse 6. So you, by the help of your God, return. In other words, repent. Come back to God, whom you perhaps for a while have forsaken. Return. Observe mercy. That's one ingredient of repentance, of coming back to God. Observe mercy and justice, and then wait on your God continually. Don't avenge yourself. Wait for God. He will fight your battles. That's not your duty to do so. Many times we think we have to. No, you wait for God. He will fight your battles. And so what I'd like to do now is to give you some examples at what it means to observe mercy, what it means to show compassion, what it means to love God and neighbor. And of course, you cannot love God and neighbor without having mercy, without having compassion, and without having the willingness to forgive. A very famous example is the parable Christ gave regarding the quote-unquote good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, you find that parable. And I don't want to read the entire parable, but let's notice in verse 25 how it starts. Luke 10 and verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Good question, right? And he said to him, what's written in the law? I mean, you are a lawyer, you should know, right? What's written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Christ said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live. You shall, you shall inherit eternal life. Of course, he wanted to justify himself and said, yeah, but who is my neighbor? And then Christ is giving this example, this parable of the good Samaritan. And you know this parable, I mean, there were people who saw this man being under, you know, being injured by the robbers and nobody was willing to help him until the Samaritan came and Christ picks the Samaritan because the Samaritans and the Jews had nothing to do with each other. They hated each other. And here's a Samaritan, and he, if he hated the Jews, I don't know, but anyhow, he forgot his hate, so to speak, and he helped this man, this robber, and he is a man who fell under the, under the robbers, and so he took care of him. And so Christ then asked the question, verse 36, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And before he is asking the question in his parable, in verse 33, he said, A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So here we have the concept of compassion. And now he's asking the question, well, who was the neighbor? And so in verse 37, he said, he who showed mercy on him. So here again, we have compassion and mercy combined. 
And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And that is how you love God and your neighbor. Helping your neighbor if the neighbor is in need. Showing him mercy. Showing him compassion. Even if you have some grudge with him, perhaps. In Matthew chapter 23, Christ is making a very foundational and fundamental statement when it comes to mercy. Matthew 23 and verse 23. And he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and he could have added the lawyers here. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithes of men and anise in common, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. And these you ought to have done. He wasn't going away and doing with the tithing. But he says, without leaving the others undone. So mercy is one of the weightier, weightier matters of the law. It's important. Much more than sacrifice is important. Because he makes that point, too, in Matthew chapter 9 and in verse 13. Matthew 9 and verse 13. Because he was accused of eating with people who were looked down on, sinners. And he had just said, well, you know, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But then he says in verse 13, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Not the outward appearance of rituals, of traditions, no, he wants the mercy from the heart, as we will see. That's what he desires. And he goes on to say, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. So mercy should be extended to sinners, whom Christ came to bring them to repentance. In Hebrews chapter 5, Paul is talking about a human high priest. Of course, he compares him with Christ. But I want to look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 2 insofar as the comment regarding the human high priest is concerned. And I guess we can identify with that person. And he says in Hebrews 5 and verse 2, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also beset by weakness. You see, we all were ignorant at one time. We all went astray at one time. We might do it now. We might do things now which are wrong. But since we realize that, since we see that, hopefully we do, understanding we have weakness, we then could have compassion on those who have the same kind of weakness, maybe in different ways. Oh, I would never do what he does. I would never do what she does. Yeah, but what do you do? What do I do? That's where mercy comes in, having compassion on those who are ignorant. Like Christ says, I came to call the sinners to repentance. Because of my mercy, I did that. Notice Luke chapter 15. Here's another interesting, famous parallel. It's a parable of the lost son. But again, let's look at the context. Luke 15. And let's look at verse 10. That's how it starts. Sometimes we start reading in verse 11. Don't see quite the context. Luke 15 and verse 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then he gives a parable 
of the lost son. Of course, we know that parable. He leaves, he has the inheritance with him, and then he loses it all. There without any money, without any help, without anything, and then he says, oh, I'll go back to my father's house. At least I had food there. And then he says in verse 18, that's what the son is saying, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Context is sinning and forgiveness and repentance. Verse 19, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. The context, mercy, compassion, forgiveness. He had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, I have sinned against you and against heaven and so on. And so the father said, oh, I am so happy you are back. Verse 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He has repented. He has been forgiven. Well, the older brother didn't see it that way. He was angry about the fact that now there was a feast even made for the younger son. And in verse 29, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as a son of yours, not my brother, the son of yours come, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots and so on, you kill the fatted calf for him. Then in verse 32, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother, not the son of mine, your brother, was dead and is alive again, was lost, is found. You see the difference in reaction. The father was willing to forgive, the brother wasn't. The brother wasn't willing to show compassion or mercy, but the father did. Sin, repentance, compassion, forgiveness, all of that is included in this parable. And after that introduction, so to speak, I'd like to talk about some examples how we can be without mercy, without compassion, without forgiveness, how we can live like the world does, and why God does not approve of such conduct. I'd like to go to the book of Proverbs now and read a few scriptures, one of which Mr. Michael Ling in his sermonette came awfully close to. He read the verse before and the verse behind, but not the one which I'm going to read in a few moments. But let's turn to Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10. Very famous scripture, actually, but look at the way it's being worded. A righteous man regards the life of his animal. He's not neglecting his animals, the ones in his or her care. But the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Now, what exactly does that mean? The New American Bible, I believe, brings it better and clearer. It says, the heart of the wicked is merciless, even towards animals. It's just a merciless person who doesn't have it in his heart to show mercy. In Proverbs chapter 16, Proverbs 16 and verse 27, an ungodly man an unrighteous man, not somebody we want to be, an ungodly man digs up evil, and it is on his lips like a burning fire. Are we sometimes digging up evil? Are we sometimes going back into the past, something which has long been forgiven, should have been long Forgotten, but we are digging it up again. Specifically, a situation arises and, well, you know, one word leads to the next, and let's go back 
That's what you did in the past. No, if it's in the past, leave it at the past. Don't bring it up again. If you have forgiven, you should forget. This is how we should act and behave. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 9. Proverbs 17 and verse 9. He who covers a transgression seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates the best of friends. Or you could also say, he who repeats a matter, he who uncovers a matter, separates the best of friends. You see, rather than digging up evil, you leave it in the ground, you leave it buried. You don't bring it up again. If grass has grown over it, so to speak, let the grass there. Don't dig it up. The same concept in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. Proverbs 10 and verse 12. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Cover it. Let it in the past. Don't bring it up again. It's the surest way of getting into a mentality and attitude of unwillingness to have compassion, unwillingness to have mercy, unwillingness to forgive. And again, notice Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 11. Proverbs 19 and verse 11. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger. And it is to his glory to overlook a transgression. Interesting how the authorized version brings it, to pass over a transgression. That's where the word Passover comes from. When we take the Passover, we want our sins to be forgiven. A reminder that Christ died for us. In the same way, we should pass over transgressions others might have committed against us. It is his glory to overlook those. It's not our glory to dig them up, to bring them back to the forefront of discussions. And also in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, notice what Solomon has to say about that. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 21. Also, do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also you own, your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. You the thing of the high priest and the compassion he has because of his weakness, he can look at others because he realizes, too, I'm not faultless. And so the same thing, the idea is like, don't dwell on what people may say about you. The NIV explains, it means don't pay attention to it. They talk about you, let them talk. Don't get bothered by it. And we'll certainly don't get influenced by it and, you know, pass it on by thinking evil about others. That can easily happen. It's the surest way to lose compassion and tender mercies. Notice the book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2 and verse 13. And of course, I specifically talk about members in the church now. And as we have obtained forgiveness, we'll come to that, we should forgive others. 
but the negative is also true. But first, in James chapter 2 and verse 13, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Now, that's a strong statement. We are going to be judged without mercy by God if we have refused to show mercy ourselves towards others. And it goes on to say, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, why is that? Why does mercy triumph over judgment? Think about that a moment. What does it have to do with the fact that you have to give account for everything you will do in the time of judgment? In Psalm chapter 18, we get already the answer to the question as to why mercy triumphs over judgment. Psalm 18, verses 25 and 26. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the poor, you will show yourself poor or pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. But the point is, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. The opposite is true, too. God is not going to show himself very merciful towards us if we have refused to show mercy towards others. Christ says the same thing in Matthew chapter 5, very famous statement. But that is why mercy triumphs over judgment. You might say over condemnation. Because you have obtained forgiveness for your evil deeds. That's why mercy and compassion and forgiveness all go together. Matthew 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy from God, also to an extent mercy from others. When others see that we are merciful, maybe they will react in kind. As I said, mercy leads to the forgiveness of sin. Now, that is also true for us. When we are merciful, when we are compassionate, we are much more able and willing to forgive others for their transgressions against us. Notice Proverbs chapter 28, because there is something called repentance which has to be looked into in connection with this, we understand that in Proverbs chapter 28 and in verse 13. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have what? Mercy. We confess to God. We walk away from the sin we have committed, and God will mercifully forgive us. Now, if we want to cover it, then of course we won't prosper, God is saying. Now, we can also confess transgressions to others, in other words, we read about the fact that when we are sick, we should confess one to another. It shouldn't say our sins, but transgressions. In other words, we have sinned against another person, which has kind of brought about a problem between us that should be rectified. That's also something in order to bring about rectification and, again, a situation where people can deal with each other again. Also in Proverbs chapter 16, 
and verse 6. Proverbs 16 and verse 6. Let's just, before I go into that, let's just talk about a potential example. It's not that potential, it's not that imagined, but, you know, somebody does something wrong in the church, and he is sorry about it, and he makes it clear, well, this was wrong, I shouldn't have done it, I'm very sorry. And the other person is saying, okay, I accept that, but from now on I'm not going to talk to you anymore. You know, is that the kind of mercy, the kind of compassion, the kind of forgiveness we're talking about? Proverbs 16 and verse 6. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Atonement, forgiveness. You know, in mercy, it's being given. In other words, God has a mercy. Because of that, he forgives. If he has the same kind of mercy to forgive others, when they have transgressed against us. There is an example again. Christ gives another parable. It is a parable of the so-called unforgiving servant. Let's look at that in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, and again, let's look at the context. Matthew 18, and let's look at verse 21 to begin with. What is the context here? The introduction. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? That's a lot, right? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with a servant. So the context is forgiveness of sin. And so then he brings the parable of the unforgiving servant, and then you know that parable. In other words, he is somebody who is owing a lot of money to the master, and he asking for mercy, is asking for forgiveness of his debt, and the master is willing to forgive him. Verse 27 we read in Matthew 18, Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, forgave him the debt. You see, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, all knowing together. Now what does a servant do? Another servant owed him a terribly, comparatively speaking, very small amount. But he is going after him, and he throws him into jail because he couldn't pay him back. And so the master hears about that, and he's extremely angry. And in verse 20, uh, 33, he says to this servant, Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And many say here, mercy. So the question is, should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servants, just as I had mercy on you. Mercy, compassion, forgiveness. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Verse 35, now Christ explains what this is all about. He says, so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. You know, you have obtained forgiveness for your sins and for your trespasses. Because of God's compassion and mercy, he's saying, you've got to do the same thing. You don't dig it up. What's in the past? Leave it in the past. Forgive. Forget. Leave it alone. And it has to be done from the heart even, not just as a routine kind of a procedure. Let's talk about God's compassion, his mercy, his forgiveness. And we all are to become perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Nobody has reached that kind of perfection yet, but we have to move towards it. 
Notice Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 38. talking about all the terrible sins the Israelites had been doing. For 38, but he, talking about God, Christ actually, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Because of his compassion, he forgave them. He overlooked what they had been doing, didn't bring about destruction. On them at that point. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 8. And I'm reading for this reading for this A to 14. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, not punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So they're gone. If we act towards our brother, our sister, and the church, they should be gone. Don't bring them up again. Verse 13, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Well, God remembers that. <laughs> we should remember that too. You know, you are all dust. So am I. Let's remember that. And none of us has reached perfection yet. None of us is sinless None of us can say, oh, I'm totally without sin, so why is this person not without sin? Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7, and let's look at verses 18 and 19. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over, again the concept here, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue, bury our iniquities. That's the description of God. God's mercy leads to forgiveness, also because of his compassion. What about us? Does this apply to us? In the book of Lamentations, right after the book of Jeremiah, we find a few comments in that regard as well, insofar as God is concerned. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22. You know, here a people is described, they have sinned greatly against God. But what does Jeremiah say here? Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. Sometimes we might be so upset with somebody that we really can't even control ourselves. And then we got to think of God and about God and the way how he dealt with us. And that can help us to have a better perspective, perhaps. Notice Lamentation chapter 3, verse 31 and 32. Lamentation 3, verse 31. For the Lord will not cast off forever, though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Think of Job. Job had to go through a lot of problems. Because ultimately it was because of his self-righteousness, which he was unable to see until God revealed it to him. But James says, think of the 
game, the goal, whatever God wanted to do, and think of how merciful he was towards Job. Because if Job wouldn't have seen this problem, he would not have been in God's kingdom. That's how serious it was. And so there is a plan. Even when we go through problems in this life, God has a plan for us. And we should also understand that, that we consider others in the same light. Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. And let's note verse 17. Nehemiah 9 and verse 17. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. They hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. I mean, total rebellion against God, right? How did God react? But you are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and you did not forsake them. Even then he didn't. Even then he didn't. Now, if somebody acts towards us like that, would we react the way God reacted? We've got to learn to be able to do that. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Now, of course, the rebellion got to be taken care of. Of course, it got to be repented of. That's clear. But never think, because you have sinned greatly, God couldn't forgive you. You went beyond what God is willing to accept. Remember, Christ came to call sinners to repentance. The key is to return to God, obviously. But the key is not to think that, oh, I'm now beyond his reach. Remember, as long as you are sorry for your sins, you have not committed the unpardonable sin. If you have committed the unpardonable sin, that means you don't care anymore. It's over. You hate God. Now, of course, I do not believe that this applies to many, because some, unfortunately, do fall into that category. Notice Psalm 51. David understood that he had sinned, that he needed forgiveness. And he also understood something about the nature of God, his character. Psalm 51 and verse 1. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Because of God's tender mercies, he knew that he could obtain and would obtain forgiveness. Now, I mean, here was David. He had committed adultery with his loyal servant's wife, and then he was instrumental for killing that servant. He sinned terribly. But he knew even then, with sincere repentance, God would forgive him. And God has forgiven him, because he will be in God's kingdom. Now, that's no justification. That's no intention or improvement or the concept like, oh, you do like David did. That's not what we are talking about. I'm only giving this as an example to show that no sin is too serious for God to forgive upon repentance, and no sin should be too serious for us that we are not willing to forgive the person who has sinned against us. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, 
further 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Now, there are some out there, might be even listening in, or maybe not listening in, but they might listen to the sermon later once we have posted them. They hear the words we heard about hearing. They see the words in writing or in reading the Bible, so we heard about seeing. But it doesn't sink in. They still want to do what they want to do. Never thinking in terms of, well, maybe I should be part of the body of Christ. They want to do their own individual lives, thinking this way they can get into God's kingdom. They don't need the church. And so God is telling them, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And Jesus Christ is the head of his church. You cannot be a quote-unquote individual Christian and still think you can make it. Verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Again, mercy and forgiveness going hand in hand. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, 35 to 37. He says to us, Jesus Christ says to us, love your enemies. Now, how do you do that? <laughs> love your enemies. Do good and lend. See, you have the person falling under the robbers. In a sense, he was the enemy of that good Samaritan. Because, as I said, they had no love for each other. Think in terms today. The Jews, the Palestinians, the fight they are involved in. Would a Jew help a Palestinian if he is in need or the other way around? It says... Love your enemies, do good, lend nothing, hoping nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful. Here's a description of what it means to be merciful. Love your enemy, do good to him who hates you, help him if he is in need. He is merciful just as, or be you merciful just as your father also is merciful. Merciful towards you. Merciful towards others. You know, we were God's enemies before he called us out of this world. So loving your enemy, showing mercy, don't judge, forgive. Because we go, go on to read in verse 37, after he just said, be merciful, just as your father is merciful, judge not. So, apparently, judging is contrary to being merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Notice, first God forgives us, obviously, when he calls us out of this world and we start repenting. But then he wants to have a continued attitude from us. Okay, we have obtained forgiveness, now we have to forgive others so that God can again forgive us. It's a process. It doesn't stop. And so, let's talk a little bit about how to be merciful. With what kind of an attitude? And what will be the consequences if we have the right kind of attitude? First in Hosea chapter 10, let's go back to the book of Hosea, chapter 10 and verse 12. Hosea 10 and verse 12. It says, Sow for yourselves righteousness and reap in mercy. 
You see how that goes together? An unrighteous person will not reap mercy. Why? Because he doesn't have any mercy. We just read that. There is no mercy in the heart of an ungodly person. But you sow for yourself righteousness and reap in mercy. He goes on to say, break up your fellow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. It is all a process. Of course, we cannot be truly merciful if we are separated from God. There's no way. But once we are close to God, we can have this kind of mercy God requires of us. But it's not just showing mercy. The question is how? How do we do it? Let's go back to the book of Micah. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Of you. Of me. Of everyone. And especially when it comes to church members. But to do justly, because there is no justice in the world, we have read, to love mercy. Love it. Love to be merciful. Not just do it because of routine, grudgingly. No, you love mercy and, of course, to walk humbly with your God because you understand, hey, I'm not perfect and I need your mercy and I'm willing to extend your mercy to others. Romans chapter 12 and verse 8. Romans 12 and verse 8. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. With cheerfulness. The New Jerusalem Bible says, because you enjoy doing it. In other words, you love mercy and you enjoy being merciful towards others. Does this describe us? Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 21. Proverbs 14 and verse 21. He who despises his neighbor sins. Who is your neighbor? Everyone you come in contact with is your neighbor. So you despise your neighbor, your friend, your brother, your sister, whatever it may be, your father, your mother. You sin, God is saying. But he who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. Again, you see, showing mercy with the right kind of attitude, makes you happy. It lifts you up. Proverbs 14 and verse 31. He who oppresses a poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him, the one who honors God, he has mercy on the needy. He doesn't overlook the need of a person. The good Samaritan didn't overlook the man who was had fallen under the robbers. Here the Levite and the ones who walked by, they didn't care. They didn't care. But he had mercy on the needy, and in doing this, he honored God. Or you could say because he honored God, he did that. Another scripture in Proverbs chapter 14 in Proverbs chapter, uh, let's go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verse 21. Psalm 37 and verse 21. Here's another interesting principle of a godly person and of a godless person. It says, 
The wicked borrows and doesn't repay. How many times have I given some of my stuff to others, loaning them stuff, and never seen them back? I remember in one case, it was actually a wife of a minister, and I had given her a book to read, and then I never heard anything, and then I ultimately contacted her because I really liked, liked, that, liked that book. Oh, you never gave me that book. I did. Oh, I don't know where it is. The wicked borrows and doesn't repay. But the righteous shows mercy and gives. He doesn't have to borrow. He can give what he has, and he shows mercy to those who are in need. A description of a righteous person. He shows mercy and gives, giving a way of life. Then this is a way of life which is taking. What way of life are we living? The way of give or the way of take? We heard about the fact in the sermonette that Christ would go out to heal people. Why did he do it? Amongst other reasons. Here is one in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14 and verse 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. He was so moved with compassion that he was willing to heal. Of course, we may not be able to do that kind of thing, because every time that somebody writes me and asks for an anointed clause, and as long as a person understands, doesn't have to be a member, you're sending the cloth out for sure. But there are other ways we can show our compassion and help people who are in need. Did you realize that mercy comes from God? James chapter 3 tells us this, and frankly he tells us even more than that. James chapter 3 and verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So the wisdom from above is full of mercy. In other words, you understand that showing mercy is pursuant to godly wisdom. God tells you that's what you should do. And it's wise to do it. Why is that? Why is that? Now, in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 17, something else is added to this. And of course, it goes back to what I actually had already covered earlier. Proverbs 11. And verse 17, the merciful man does good for his own soul, but he who is cruel troubles his own flesh. He does good for himself. Why? Because you are merciful, you will obtain mercy. Merciful compassionate, willing to forgive, you will obtain mercy and compassion and forgiveness from God. In that way, you are doing good for yourself. Not that this has to be the motivation, but it's an automatic relationship. And so, what we need to do, because all of us are lacking in this regard, we have to ask God for his mercy and his forgiveness. Notice Luke chapter 18. Again, a very famous parable Christ is giving here. There are two people going up, up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, 
want a tax collector. The Pharisee thinks he has, has no need for mercy or forgiveness because he looks at his outward appearance as what he is doing and so he was completely, totally righteous in his own mind. The tax collector, however, knew who he was. And so in Luke chapter 18, and in verse 13, we read, And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner, as it should say. The sinner. I am the worst of them all. God be merciful to me. And what did Christ say? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, that Pharisee, who didn't think he needed forgiveness, who didn't think he needed God's mercy. So ask God sincerely for his mercy, for his forgiveness, and God will give it to you. And so we have to look for God's mercy. We have to desire it. That has to become part of our lives. And this includes all the things I've mentioned today, and probably a lot more. Leaving things buried in the ground. Don't bring them up again. Don't resurrect them. Forgive and forget it. Don't ever bring it up. Luke chapter I mean, the book of Jude, I should say. Jude, chapter 1, only one chapter, verse 21. It says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. As I said earlier, without God's mercy, without God's forgiveness, Without God's compassion, which we are willing to explain or play out, show with love, we won't, re we won't reach the point where we'll obtain eternal life. And so in Luke chapter 1 and verse 50, in conclusion, we read this principle, which is important in order to obtain God's mercy, and then having also that mercy in our heart to extend it to others. Luke 1 and verse 50. His mercy, God's mercy, is on those who fear him, and that from generation to generation. In other words, without end. On those who fear him, who respect God, who understand, he is the one who has forgiven us, so that's the reason why we need to forgive others. And that means then, extending mercy to others if we want to receive mercy from God. Let's keep that in mind. We need God's mercy. But God wants us to be merciful to others and especially to the members in his church.